Good morning. My name is Bruce. I'm 76 years old. I was born in the United States of America, but I've lived the last 53 years in Germany. However, this video is not about me. Welcome to our living room in our 120-year-old abbey that my wife Karen and I bought 13 years ago and have restored in that time. However, this video is not about our home. So you ask if this video is not about you and it's not about, about your home, what's it about? Well, I'm glad you asked because it's about this um, instrument, this musical instrument next to me here, which most people probably will recognize as uh, a grand piano. Ah, you say a grand piano, 80, 80, 88 keys, black and white. Well, no, this grand piano has 86 keys, actually. But uh, it can be forgiven for that because it's very old. In fact, it is almost 100 years older than I am, which makes it very old indeed. It's, um, it was built according to the um, piano books that I have that tell about the ages of pianos according to their, the numbers that you find on them. It, it was built in 1844. And um, let's see, that's 174 years ago or something like that. 174 years old. And it was built in Copenhagen or Copenhagen. And it, um, a Danish piano. And it uh, is a relatively small instrument. It's not a grand, it's not a uh, concert grand piano. But it's also not a classical baby grand piano as we know them today because if you, well, I'll show you in a moment, the strings on a baby grand piano are crossed over. That is, the bass strings are crossed over the, um, the rest of the strings. So to reduce the length of the piano, this gives a baby grand piano a belly. Uh, on this rounded side. This piano does not have that because the strings are all straight strung. I will say right off that I am not going to play this piano for you. Um, the reason is not that uh, the piano isn't playable. It is certainly playable. But uh, the reason is that uh, my hands are completely disfigured by an illness or a disease called rheumatoid arthritis and I no longer can play any musical instruments. The reason we, I, we have this grand piano is that I used to play musical instruments. I was a clarinetist. My father put a clarinet in my hand when I was just three years old and he said play. Played, and I played then on for a long time and I played until just um, 20 years ago when I no longer when this problem began and I no longer could play um, I, I like to play with orchestra I, I like to play concerts with orchestra um, more like Mozart and uh, uh, Weber and Nielsen however uh, Orchestras are not always available, and as a consequence, I also liked playing with um, a piano accompaniment. So it made sense to get a piano. Um, my wife said at the time, let's get a piano, and I said, all right, but not one of those funny little vertical pianos. Let's get a grand piano, and we laughed because we had no money whatsoever. And as it turned out, she worked at the army base, American army base, and she asked everyone who came into the library where she worked if they had a grand piano to give away. And lo and behold, one day the general of the base came in and she said, oh, you know, when I see you here, I wanted to ask, do you have a grand piano to give away? And he said, yes, actually we do. 
I can't give it to you. You'll have to pay a dollar for it. But you'll have to also pick it up. So I had a friend who drove a beer truck and he was kind enough to drive over to the base and pick up this piano. It was complete ruins, of course, as you can imagine, for one dollar. And um, as a kind of an aside, I have to admit that we never actually wound up paying the dollar. So I guess really the piano doesn't belong to me, but well, after 50 years, it seems I'm going to just assume it does belong to us. Um, the links were all broken and matched up underneath it. And uh, some of the strings were broken and there was quite a bit wrong with it, let's just say. In fact, uh, it took me nearly 600 hours of work to put it into the condition that it is in here. And um, I did not do that work uh, completely on my own because I had no idea how to rebuild a piano. However, in the neighboring town where we lived at the time, uh, there was an old piano maker who, when he heard about it and heard that I wanted to rebuild it, told me that uh, he would help me. He would give me advice on how to do it, and he would also uh, loan me the tools that I would need, because a few tools you do need to, uh, specialized tools you do need to uh, uh, have when you're rebuilding a piano. So I did that. That was in 1968 and 69. So that was a long time ago, of course. The piano served us quite well. I played my clarinet and various people came and accompanied me on the piano. It wasn't perfect because it is a very, very old instrument. The, um, the action that is the keyboard, which I will show you, and I will show you more about the instrument in detail. Uh, the action is very, very simple. It's called a Broadwood English action. The action are the mechanical parts the keys that operate the hammers and the Broadwood action has no accelerating levers or any other mechanical parts that are common in modern pianos. But um, for most music, people have played Brahms on it, which is very demanding, of course, for a piano, and uh, they have gotten along with it quite well, so uh, we'll just say that it's, it's quite adequate. Um, it served me well because I could play my clarinet and I could, like I say, be accompanied by various pianists at home. And um, so that's, that's kind of the way that we came about to own the piano. Getting it up the stairs in this house was another story, which I won't even bother telling you about, but it was, uh, it was pretty exciting. Considering that the stairs at the time, before we replaced them, were so old that they were almost... Uh, ready to collapse. Uh, I think I will now show you the um, details of the piano. I'll take out the, um, the action and show you the way the keys operate, the, the hammers and so on. Uh, I haven't done that for a long time. I'll have to uh, unloosen some screws first. I'll do that. One of the, thing, one of the things that you'll notice right away here and if you, knew, if you know something about pianos, you'll also be kind of surprised about it, is that this piano has a metal frame. Now that's not surprising today. However, in 1844, it was not just unusual, it was unique. Uh, this is supposed to be the first uh, piano, or this, uh, this model of this individual piano, is supposed to be the first piano made in Europe with a, with a metal or iron frame. Um, until that time, pianos were made exclusively of wood with, with, with metal strings and, and some metal uh, hardware, but, uh, general, but the frame was always made of wood. The disadvantage, of course, of a wood frame is that um, it buckles and moves uh, with 
temperature and humidity changes, and it also is not structurally as strong uh, as, as metal. The metal frame in this piano is um, not very heavy. It was, I, I could lift it at the time and when I was a younger man. I could lift it without any problem myself, probably weighed 100 pounds or so, but um, uh, maybe a little more than that. However, um, uh, compared to a modern piano, uh, it's a very light frame. Of course, the iron or steel frame in a piano is generally attributed to Steinway in the USA. However, there's some reason to believe that this frame, this piano was built with a metal frame before the first Steinways were brought out. Um, as I mentioned before, you can see that the strings are all straight. They go, the, the bass strings go from one end straight across to the other, rather than being crossed over here, as I mentioned, uh, in a so-called modern baby grand piano. This piano is just a little larger than a baby grand, but uh, that's uh, uh, be because, of course, the, the bass strings are uh, straight strung. The dampers here are very simple. They're just uh, felt pads that are raised by spring-loaded uh, levers in the bottom here. I'll show you that, or I'll show you some of that from when I take the uh, when I take the keyboard out. I've removed or I've loosened the uh, cover for the keyboard. I'm going to take it out now so that I can remove the keyboard to show you the uh, the action itself. All right, I've uh, taken the action part way out here. I'll bring it out the rest of the way and set it up on here. So you can see the see the keys and the pivots of the keys that are here. They're just pins. That's, you can lift one of the keys up here. So it's just a pin. There's a little felt washer underneath it. And in these keys, there are little felts that I had to re-glue. Um, the keys move up and down very, very lightly, of course. Um, are you seeing... I'm looking at my... I have the picture of what you're seeing on my cell phone here, so that's why I keep looking down, by the way. I apologize for that. Um, let's come around here to the side and I'll show you how the, uh, the actual key moves the hammer. I think you should be able to see it there, yes. Yes. When I press the key down, it pushes a little pin up here, or a little arm, and that presses on the hammer all the, everything that touches, every piece of wood that touches one another is coated with or covered with a piece of felt so that it doesn't make clacking noises. There you can see how the action works. It's very, very simple, obviously. It is nothing like a modern piano. The key, the, the hammer is actually caught back here. You see there's a catch here so that it doesn't bounce. Otherwise, if, if it if I would just let it go, it would bounce like that, and it catches the catches the hammer. Yeah, it catches the hammer so uh, that it doesn't bounce. Uh, the felts are original. Well, I don't know. They're probably not. You know, they probably are actually original, but I uh, did quite a bit of work on them. You have to very carefully with a um, very fine sandpaper actually round the felts off a little bit. They're quite flat here again from playing, but I'm not going to do any more with this piano since I can't use it and uh, I have no friends anymore, <laughs> no friends alive anymore who uh, can play the piano, so I'm not going to do anything with it. Whoever gets it when I'm gone, that's uh, they, they can do what they want with it, of course, then, or they will. Um, I'll show you from the front here the springs that bring the little levers up so that they catch the 
so that they catch the um, the hammers. I have to come down with this. So there we are. Excuse me for this rather coarse movement here. I'll bring you in a little bit here. So there we are. I'll show you down at the last key here. You can see here, there's a little spring and there's a little tiny bit of, um, it's actually a fine string that connects the spring to the lever. I don't know whether you can really see that or not. If I was good at drawing, I'd draw this, but I'm not good at drawing, so I won't. The, um, the disadvantage of this is that for very, very fast, like uh, one of my friends tried to play uh, a, a piece by Shostakovich on it, and he laughed because the, the, the action could not keep up with, with his uh, playing. This is uh, part of the, this is what happens to us when we get old, we get slow. And actually this uh, piano was always slow in that sense. It's amazingly good, as I said. Brahms is not a problem. And um, it's only when you get to Stravinsky or, or uh, Prokofiev, Shostakovich, that uh, you're going to have problems, I think, with it. Nobody would normally play any of those composers on an instrument like this anyway. It's ideal for Scriabin, for uh, uh, Mozart, uh, uh, Telemann. It, um, there's absolutely no reason that it can't be used for, uh, it can't, that you can't play those composers on it, to be sure. Uh, is there anything more to see? Oh, yes, the action of the, um, the, the dampers. I can show you them here, if I can get down far enough with this tripod. I also have to use a tripod, by the way, because, uh, well, I, I just shake too much to uh, hand hold the camera. The, the, um, you can see the, um, the little levers down here that operate the, i show you here, that operate the uh, dampers. The dampers are what keep the strings from uh, vibrating after you take your finger off the key. They can be lifted by a pedal in the bottom there, and there's a mechanical part there. You can see that's aluminum. I had to make a piece out of aluminum. The, the, the original wooden piece was gone, and I couldn't make it out of... I didn't have the ability at the time to make it out of wood, so I made it out of aluminum. It's actually just a bar over there. There you can see it now a bar that uh, moves the whole keyboard over and eliminates what it does is keeps the 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 keys from operating those buffer uh, levers down there so that you can, so that the uh, key the string will continue to vibrate the rumor was when we got this piano which came which we which, as I said, my friend with the beer truck picked up at an American army base. The army base was actually a German caserne, an artillery caserne, uh, Panzer caserne, um, that in the Second World War, of course, was home to a bunch of tanks. And uh, the rumor was, or what we were told, was that this piano had belonged to Erwin Rommel, the Desert Fox and that it, he had even taken it with him to Africa. But of course, we have absolutely no evidence and no proof of that. Uh, Rommel did play the piano, I, I read that. Uh, he was quite a good pianist, I guess. And uh, so, <laughs> it's a nice story in any case, but like I say, we have no indication to believe that it's, uh, that it's really true. More, what I do uh, know for sure is that it was in terrible, terrible condition when I got it. The legs were broken up underneath it, as I said, and um, the boards down here, which are 
structural, not musical. <laughs> they don't change the tone, but they are structural. Um, were completely eaten away by uh, termites or, or wood-eating worms of some kind. And um, so I had to replace them. I had tried to get old lumber that uh, had been stored a long time. I went to a, even went to a barrel maker to try to get to, to get some old lumber. I had trouble proving, uh, that is, making certain that it really was old. And in fact, a couple of the pieces probably weren't because as they aged and dried after the, I glued them in, uh, they cracked. So uh, they probably were not as old as I was told they were. Uh, as to gluing, that's an interesting uh, subject. The, the top the boards here were cracked. I'm gonna, maybe I can bring you over close enough to see that. You can see the crack right here. This board was cracked all the way across and simply broken all the way across. Um, the main board, this main board here, which because of the reflection you're not going to be able to see too well. I guess you can't. No, I guess it's not important. It was cracked here. There's a, there's, I can still see the crack very, very clearly here. It was cracked somewhere else here. I'm not sure. He, oh, here, here it was cracked all the way across. The, this top board was in three pieces. The the cover here, this cover was in two pieces, and uh, I glued them. At the time, I was you know, working as an electron microscopist. I was doing my PhD actually at the time, uh, and um, I used uh, a lot of two component um, epoxy, and I talked to the old piano maker about it and I explained to him about using two component epoxy glues which at that time were still relatively new and he actually <laughs> apparently read about them then and he uh, said you know that's a great idea use the glue to repair broken pieces of wood don't use it use regular um, um, carpenter's glue, white glue, to put two pieces that were not broken but needed to be glued together as they had originally been. Put Use regular carpenter's glue for that, but use the two-part epoxy for repairing these kind of things. And I'm really glad I did, also structurally, because I had to glue the legs on, basically. Well, the legs are actually in sockets that get screwed in. But um, I had to glue, glue those sockets on, and of course, uh, 50 years later, the piano is still standing, and it was moved tw uh, three times in that time. So um, apparently, the uh, using Aerodite-based epoxy glue was a was a very good idea. As I as 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 I I did as he said, and any parts that needed to be glued together that had originally been glued together, I used regular carpenter's white glue for that. You can possibly see back here that this was all broken out. I replaced the wood in this area here. Um, I didn't do anything with the soundboard because it was in very good condition. The um, frame was also in very good condition. But there is, a, there is a major weakness and that is the fact that I did not replace the tuning block which is a big block of uh, laminated wood that sits underneath this area here and the tuning pegs are driven into that. You hammer them in and then you can turn them with a special uh, wrench to, to tune the uh, individual strings. <clears throat> and I didn't replace the tuning block. It was, I just, I, I, that was beyond my ability and the old uh, piano maker had no suggestions where I could get the wood, and it was it just was too complicated. 
So what I did was put the largest tuning pegs in that I could buy. Um, <clears throat> I had to bore out all the holes, just a couple of mill or a millimeter or so, uh, so that they would, <laughs> so the tuning pegs would fit through them actually in the frame, and hammer them into the block, and they hold relatively well. If the piano is played, it really needs to be retuned every every few weeks or month. Um, it's just in the nature of an old instrument like this. Uh, if I had replaced the tuning block, if I had been able to do that, that would probably not be necessary, but um, it's just the way it is. I had to accept that compromise. I just had to accept. When I first got the piano, it had been painted with a brush. A with a thick coat of black paint on it. <clears throat> I was hoping to be able to just lightly sand it, but as it turned out, I had to use paint thinner, uh, uh, paint remover. And uh, to my surprise, when I removed the coat of black paint, uh, a coat of white paint that had also been smeared on with a brush uh, came out. And um, it was quite shocking to learn that the wood underneath was so beautiful. It is truly a beautiful piano and uh, the, the wood is uh, is just gorgeous. So um, I uh, carefully removed the rest of the paint uh, and lightly sanded it with, I think with 100, I had to use 100 to begin with, and then uh, <clears throat> uh, finally up to 800 uh, grit, very uh, fine paper to uh, to get it, give it a nice, <clears throat> to give it a nice shine. And um, then I uh, used a, I think, um, shellac. I think it's got shellac on it. Because I wanted to use an original uh, coating that would have been used at the time. And it turned out very nicely. The nice thing about shellac is you can polish it out with, with a little alcohol on a rag. And um, the... Uh, Wood is, the, the veneer is in general in very good condition. The veneer, by the way, is walnut. It's a very fine walnut. And um, the rest of the reddish brown parts here, uh, the, well, as you can see, the inside of the, <coughs> the inside of the um, lid there, and the outside of the lid, is massive. It's massive ma mahogany. So it's uh, made of very nice wood, and uh, when it's polished up like this, it looks quite nice. So there you are. Um, I think I can uh, say that's most of what there is to say about this. I'll put a few more detailed pictures uh, of the instrument on it um, uh, on the at the end here of my video. The um, the. Frank, the number of this piano is uh, 3520 from Hornell and Miller. The frame number is 1573. And according to the books that I have, those indicate that the piano was built in 1844. I have no other proof of that, but it makes sense. It sounds like right. And I've looked at pictures of Hornell and Miller's pianos from that time, and they were making models just like this. So uh, it seems like uh, we can pretty much say it was built in 1844. All right, that's about it for today. Um, I hope this wasn't too boring, and I hope you found it interesting and useful. And uh, if you have any questions, please put them in the comments below. Thank you very much for your comments. Thanks for watching, and thanks for subscribing to my channel.